Hello everyone, Angel here, and I'm finally here with my review of Klingon Academy, approximately two months after I've finished it. So, pretty much part of the course in how I tend to do these kind of uh, let's play some reviews. Um, but anyway, I got here in the end. Here it is. Um, sorry for the delay. Uh, to be fair, I have been completely concentrating on TFTC lately. Go see those videos if you haven't already, but I'm sure you have. But anyway. Klingon Academy, what do I think? I love this game. Um, I, I really love this game. This is this this is maintained at the moment as my favourite Star Trek game. Um, I made a video with uh, Lorne uh, a couple of years ago now, maybe, where we discussed our f top five Star Trek games individually. And for me, Klingon Academy came out on the top, and this is before my Let's Play through. And yeah, so far that that's that's completely justified. Uh, it's the story, the cutscenes, the gameplay. Uh, there is jank. It does take a little bit to get working and some configuring. And the game itself is actually quite complex in terms of really understanding the nuances of how everything works. But once you get it, it is really worth it. Sadly, the source code for this game uh, was lost, or has been lost for some time. I don't think it's ever going to be found, probably. But this is explaining why this game is not available via digital download, whereas Starfleet Academy is. And that's a real shame because this is objectively a every way in every way a better game than Starfleet Academy, um, and it's just a shame that uh, to, to play this game you have to either find the original CDs or copy the original CDs or DVDs, or you know other methods. But anyway, most of the issues you have uh, can be easily solved. Um, there's a certain Discord server. I'm gonna leave the link in the description of the video uh, and they will help you uh, get the game up and running. There's a fan patch you're going to need and this uh, A fixes a couple of bugs with the game which uh, causes it to crash and B allows it to have things like widescreen support and uh, a couple of other things uh, that basically just make the game a little bit more uh, accessible to play. So let's get a bit more deep into this shall we. Let's start with the story and before I say anything else there are going to be spoilers so if you have not played this game Please bear that in mind, and I will probably also talk about other Star Trek, particularly Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country, so I, I this is going to be a spoiler-filled review, so just just be warned for this game and other games and possibly other versions of Trek. I, I, I've realised I've not actually been warning people about spoilers, so here you go, spoiler warning. So the game is split into two chunks, story-wise. The first half of the game you are doing your academy stuff, learning how to be a warship commander and at the same time learning how to play the game. The second half is then broken into the Civil War arc, which is fairly typical for a, a Klingon plot, because, you know, Klingon society is, is feudal in nature, and so it tends to, uh, without a larger existential threat for them or something else they can com uh, commonly fight against, the Klingons tend to just end up fighting themselves. We've seen this plenty of times in both Next Generation and Deep Space Nine. It all makes sense, and it's... I'm probably going to compare this game to TIE Fighter a little. Um, in fact, I will go as far as to say that this game is the TIE Fighter of Star Trek because you are playing not as the Federation, you are playing as, at least this time and period, the bad guys, but also in the way they've approached the game in, in TIE Fighter, you're not fighting the Rebels all the time. You fight the Rebels, I don't know, three or four battles maybe of the, of the 13 battle campaigns there are. Most of the game is you fighting other Imperials uh, because well, in law, the rebels only have a certain amount of resources and ships and whatnot, whereas the Empire has, well, a lot. It's slightly different here, but the, the principle's the same. The, the Klingons and the Federation do not go to full-scale war at any time during the, well, okay, Discovery want that aside, but at, at this point in history, they don't really go into any kind of full-scale war. There's, they skirmish. It, it's a whole war most of the time. Um, so we can't actually fight the Federation properly when it gets to the second half of the game. You can only fight the Federation during the first half of the game because it's all a simulator, right? And so we need another opponent. So we get the Klingons and we also get uh, the Romulans as well as a semi-occurring regular threat in the, the second half of the game as well. Because, of course, what Civil War, what Klingon Civil War would not be complete without some shady Romulan interference uh, trying to uh, get the other hand? The absolute star of this whole game is Christopher Plummer. He fucking owns every scene he's in. He just gives it it all, he hams it up when it's needed, but often his quiet introspection and ability to deliver uh, is such a stark contrast to your typical Klingon warrior. I mean, 
I think uh, one of the other side characters, Poktal, uh, and Zhajek are pretty good examples of what you know, a bit more of a typical aggressive Klingon warrior that we tend to see. David Warner also owned his scenes. Um, he was there for three or four times. Probably they managed to get him in for one day, and that's all they needed. Um, but he he also manages to basically you know get, get the character of Gorkon back. That again, very quiet, introspective, um, intelligent Klingon. Very atypical of what we tend to see of Klingons. But yeah, go, going back to Plummer though, I mean, I can't imagine this game without him. Uh, I mean, comparing the cutscenes to Starfleet Academy, it was fine, it was functional. Uh, you had Shatner, you had uh, Takei, and you had Koenig, and they were fine. Uh, but it wasn't like knock it out of the park in terms of uh, acting or, or writing or anything like that. It, it was fairly, it was okay, it was Star Trek, I was very happy with that, that was no problem. But this, I mean, I, I'm hanging on pretty much every word that Chang is saying, and at one point, I, I actually started tearing up. Uh, it's uh, the penultimate mission, I think, where Chang has rushed across the Federation border thinking the Federation were invading when in, in fact a massive Romulan fleet is about to attack the Klingon homeworld, and you have to convince him that it's a ploy and he has to come back and save the Klingon Empire and the look on his face because at some point earlier in the game you'd already once kind of I wouldn't say humiliate but denied him his right or his his dream of dying in battle against the Federation and when we tell him that we have to do this and we appeal to his honor after learning everything we have in the game we basically throw that back in his face and his reaction to that you feel so bad for the guy and if this game has done anything, it has massively fleshed out the character of Chang. In Star Trek VI, he's pretty much just a villain. I wouldn't go so far to say as a one-note villain, but he doesn't have a lot of depth either. We never really understand his motivations uh, for why he did what he did in Star Trek VI, but he's not exactly a, a stupid villain either. He's he was, he was entertaining. He basically tends to be held in the same kind of regard as Khan, just maybe a bit below that, but he, he is one of the all-time great villains of Star Trek, absolutely. But in this game, he's not really a villain at all. I, I, I can't see Chang as a villain. I kind of see him as a tragic character. He is one of the best Klingons in terms of his honor, his tactical abilities, and his ability to teach. But his one big flaw is his absolute blind hatred of the Federation and what it represents to him and what he thinks it will do to the Klingon Empire if the Federation ever, you know, if the Klingons join the Federation or if the Federation subsumes the Klingons somehow, he thinks it's going to lead to a loss of whatever he holds dear about Klingon society. We know the Federation is not going to necessarily do that, but we can understand his point of view. But it does lead to this absolute blind spot, and when it comes to the Federation, he is just, there is no negotiating or chatting with him on the issue. That's, that's how, he, how he sees it. And it just makes me think, what a shame the character ends up dying as he does. I mean, it, it, it makes sense, I guess, but it's just, I want to see more of Chang. Can you imagine if Chang, if, if Martok and Chang were in the same uh, time period, Martok and Chang working together? What a team. That would have been an amazing uh, team. The Dominion would have never stood a chance against those two. That's what I'm saying. Enough about gushing about Chang there, let's talk about some of the other characters. One thing this uh, game is very different on in terms of stuff, well, there's actually a lot of things, but uh, one of the things. Um, Starfleet Academy was very uh, more focused on your crew and dialogue to solve a lot of missions. Klingon Academy has next to none of this. You do have a crew, but you never see them on screen, you basically hear a couple of different voices. And the dialogue choices you do get in game are very, very few and far between. There's, there's not a lot to go there. So there's, there's very little in terms of uh, actually trying to dialogue boss your way through things. There's a couple of things, especially towards the end, and a, a bit smattered around the game. But otherwise, that's it. This game is purely focused generally on starship combat and. Playing from the Klingon side of view, it's actually a lot more, you, you've got a better excuse to be fighting than you do as the Federation. The Federation is all about diplomacy, and that works well for Starfleet Academy. You have a lot of dialogue options. You, it feels more like you're being a Starfleet commander. In this, it's all about combat, and it works, and I, I like that. But I am a little disappointed that there there wasn't more crew interaction. That the most kind of interaction we get on the sort of lower level side, we we have Zhajek, we had uh, Kempek. That is the same Kempek who will lead the the Klingon Empire uh, decades into the future. <laughs> Actually, just side note, one thing I like is that he's still fat, 
and that absolutely makes sense because if you remember, I think it's Sins of the Father, TNG, Worf's maternal grandmother type person says uh, Kempek always had an eye for her, and even back then he was still fat. So nice, nice little bit of attention to detail there. Uh, and then we had uh, Kaporik. And these three characters you tended to see on and off, more, more often during the Academy side, on, on the uh, the second half of the game, like, um, aside from Zsa who dies, uh, the other two kind of pop up once or twice, and that's it. Uh, they're not really developed that much. Zsa actually gets probably the most screen time, and he's basically the Mr. Punchy face from Starfleet uh, Academy, but probably a bit more better done, I'd say. He, he's very... kind of one note. He's very punchable, he's very annoying. But he's also kind of fairly typical Klingon as well. He, he's always seeking glory, and he will do anything to get that glory, even when it's dumb decisions. Um, so, yeah. We do also get some instructors. We get Pokhtal, who I already mentioned, who's basically your typical uh, I'm gonna insult you to the, here in the moon and back uh, type Klingon. Very aggressive. And then you have the complete opposite in Brigadier Kamuk, who's this kind of almost grandfatherly kind of Klingon. He's very very nice to you, as far as, Kling as, far as Klingons go, anyway. Um, but we're also going to talk a bit more about Kamuk later, because he is basically responsible for um, crippling the Klingon Empire later on. Let's see, what else do I like? Um, I love the fleshing out of the Klingon lore. I mean, this game was uh, came out in, like, well, it was being developed, I imagine, sort of late 90s, early 2000s, and so at this point, DS9 is basically wrapping up. Enterprise is probably about to begin, so we're already we've already very well established the Klingon society, Klingon law. But this game still continues to add to that. In particular, uh, it, it goes out of its way of basically describing that the Klingon logo, the, th the sort of tri-tipped uh, dagger-looking logo of the Klingon Empire. Uh, they go into some lore about that, about what each tip means. So you got duty, honor, loyalty, and they are the three blades of the Klingon, the Klingon heart, and you have to balance those. And the, the first part of the game tries to teach you. Uh, about how you balance those, and this this is the core principles of being a Klingon warrior. And we do have our own Kobayashi Maru situation where two of the three uh, core principles are put into conflict with each other, which is something we see very often in um, with Worf. He's forced to make a decision between duty and loyalty and honor. Very often, that, that's a, that's his shtick, and it's done well here as well in, in trying to convey the problems you're going to face as a captain of a Klingon warship and their version of the Karabiyashi Maru is really good because rather than just facing impossible odds you have to face uh, an, an almost impossible personal decision which can affect how others view you rather than you winning the battle or not um, so I, I really enjoy that kind of nuance it's, it's really good, I really like it um, what else? Uh, I guess the bad guy? We, what was it? Um, Melkor and his brother Kalnor. Kalnor we see briefly at the start of the uh, intro. Not the best actor in the world, but uh, this is how Chang loses his eye. That's a nice little bit of detail. Uh, Melkor himself, um, he's played by, I think it's J. Paul Burma, who is a fairly semi-regular Trek alumni. He, he's showed up a few times. Uh, most He's played a Nazi officer, a holographic Nazi officer, twice separately. Uh, but he's also played a Borg, uh, and uh, he's played a Klingon, and a Pretty sure he's played one or two other things. He's he's a pretty good uh, good uh, guest actor when he does show up. But he only appears uh, as Melkor maybe I don't know three or four times. Very very little screen presence, but enough to sell that uh, this is an arrogant asshole. If I have any criticisms of Melkor, is that he is a bit dumb sometimes, and uh, I question how people are still somewhat loyal to him, even right to the end. Because uh, I already mentioned briefly, Kamuk have does a very, very dumb thing, but in a way, I, I wanted to address the uh, the honor, the, the Kobayashi Maru, the honor, loyalty, duty thing first before I, I talked about that, uh, but before that, Melkor is openly uh, liaising with, um, working with the Romulans, I, at this point in the timeline, I don't think the Klingons' hatred of the Romulans is, is as bad as it is, uh, as it is in TNG era, so maybe it's a bit more acceptable for the Klingons to work with the Romulans. But then there's the destruction of the Talinor Gates. Uh, this is basically one of their key energy production uh, systems, and Kamak, who is fighting on Melkor's side because his brother chose, and that's a nice little bit of attention to detail, because the, the elder brother is the one who makes the decisions, and you have to follow that, and that's what Kamak is doing. So he basically destroys the sun, 
uh, destroying all planets in the system, and that is one of two major energy production facilities in the Klingon Empire, which leaves only Praxis, which you can see how that will then tie into Star Trek VI because Praxis will then explode due to overmining and cause the events of, uh, of that film. But even after this, some of uh, Melkor's forces continue to fight for his side. Now, now th this is kind of uh, addressed because you do tell some of his forces and they're like, oh shit, what a dickhead. Okay, yeah, we're not fighting for him anymore. But I, I still question how anyone loyal to the Klingons, even if they want to take over and think they can do better, would support someone who would basically shoot them in the foot so badly. This is such a crippling thing for the Empire. And so I, I just generally, genuinely don't understand anyone who would continue to follow Melkor after this. Anyone. But there you go. That's that's just my thoughts. As for Kamak himself when he faces this decision, uh, I have some mixed feelings about it. I think um, it's well presented in how it is. Kamak clearly feels he's locked into his uh, duty as uh, a member of his house. He's been given a duty. He says he has to carry out his duty and he's loyal uh, to his house and what he has to do, except it's clashing with the loyalty to the Empire. In this case, the larger picture should take uh, precedent here. You are crippling the Empire by doing this, so, you know, if this was Worf, Worf would absolutely say, oh no, fuck that, I'm not going to do that. And that makes Worf infinitely a better person than Kamak. Uh, I'm not saying Kamak's a bad guy, but by making this decision, he has knowingly crippled the Empire. And, yeah. He, it shows to me that he doesn't have the courage to fight for his honor, what he, you know, the the for the greater good, uh, and that, in a way, is a flaw of the Klingon uh, society. And I love how that's presented. It is a flaw of the society. This is what the sort of decisions that end up being made as a result of that. So it's it's pretty good. If when I said I have mixed feelings, I guess what I meant to say is that it'd be nice if there was some more dialogue here. Maybe we can convince him not to do it. Um, and but then Melkor has like a backup guy doing it instead. So you know it's the the events will still happen, but you could actually choose whether you can save Kamuk or not from doing it. I think that would have been a nice little sort of thing you could have done. But anyhow. anyway, I've rambled enough about the story. What about the gameplay? The actual reason you're here to play the game? Um, it's it's pretty good. There is jank. I'm not going to lie. There is some jank here, but it is a very complex, detailed. Starship Simulator. Complete contrast to Starfleet Academy. Um, this feels like lumbering Starship combat. There's a huge variety in how you can approach a situation. You can go in all guns blazing, uh, or you can think about it more tactically, get cloak in, attack runs, cloak off, keep rinse repeating. Uh, subsystems are an absolute thing you do need to pay attention to, both on your own side and the enemy side, especially if you want to try and cripple a ship that's uh, you know, outgunning you or something like that. Taking out things like its warp nacelles or its impulse engines or something like that uh, massively reduces its ability to fight, not only for ability to move, but it affects its own power management as well. Starfleet Academy, whilst it does have this element, it's it was never really needed because the combat was over so quickly. Even when the um, the larger ships like the Excelsior or the Klingon battleship that you end up fighting later, they die so quickly that you just don't need to really mess with the subsystem management at all, uh, or worry about targeting enemy subsystems either. And also Starfleet Academy feels a lot more like a kind of floaty fighter uh, simulator, space simulator game. I think I mentioned that in my review of that, that it's, it doesn't feel like I'm flying a starship, it feels more like I'm flying a fighter. Complete, everything's a complete opposite here. As I said, it's you're you're flying a big lumbering starship, and uh, your micromanagement of your systems and how you fight the enemy absolutely are crucial to doing this. And it took me a few missions to really start getting the hang of that as well. So, the ship has nine major subsystems: anything from you know weapons, engines, power management, uh, sensors, helm, damage control. A couple of things I'm probably missing, um, and there's just this whole host of things you can do, and if you really get into it and you start playing with it and you really start to understand the system, you can absolutely change how you approach the game and how you end up fighting the enemies, and that's really cool. I really appreciate that level of depth. Um, it took, as I said, it took me a bit of encouragement to, to get that far because I, if I have a criticism of it, it's it's a little overwhelming. 
there is a lot to learn. I realise this is a game where reading the big chunky manual was, was was a requirement basically in order to understand how to play the game. But I think also the manual doesn't really um, help you with some of the nuances of this either. So some of the comments I got uh, playing the missions eventually kind of helps me to understand how to better play the game, particularly in um, using uh, defensive power management as well a lot more often so my shields didn't just drop all the time. Uh, and I'd suddenly found it a lot easier to, to take on more difficult targets. But subsystems aside, uh, the actual weapon systems and abilities you have in the game are, are nice and varied. One of my complaints with Starfleet Academy was you basically just had phasers and photon torpedoes, and you had disabling phasers as well, and that was it. You had tractor beams, but didn't really need them. Um, in this game, you have your standard disruptors and torpedoes, but you have light disruptors, you have heavy disruptors, you have light torpedoes, heavy torpedoes, then you have uh, different beam weapon types as well, um, which uh, behave like a tractor beam, but are like uh, disrupting shields or throwing micrometeorite particles at you. But you do have other types of weapons as well, so the Federation actually have beam weapons this time. They have beam weapon phases, um, the Gorn and the... Uh, I can't remember, there's another race that's invented for this game, the, the Shiruki or something like that. They all have their own types of weapons and special abilities, and that's so cool. It's it's nice that we've got this different, lots of different abilities and stuff to play with, and it, it, it shakes the game up. For example, if you're fighting a Romulan battlecruiser or something like a Romulan ship, they have plasma torpedoes. Those things absolutely murder you at point-blank range, as they should. As is depicted in the original series, the plasma torpedo is is lethal. Um, and its damage bleeds through your shields as well. But at a distance, they're not nearly as uh, as big of a threat. But if Romulan Battleship unloads four plasma torpedoes in your face, you are fucked. Um, and and it, that, that's an example of uh, changing your um, approach on how you deal with a certain type of ship. Basically, what I'm trying to say, as far as the simulation of this game goes, it's really good. I think my biggest criticism of how the AI does its work is two things, actually. One, the AI is terrible in obeying commands and helping you, so you, you do have, like in TIE Fighter, you have uh, attack targets, defend my target, that sort of thing. Whether the AI is going to do it or not, I, you know, good luck. Um, second thing is the AI is very RAM happy. Uh, it used to be even more RAM happy when the game first came out, then they kind of reduced that. And I think that's possibly a limitation of the AI and the engine of the time, but they mitigated this. They gave you three critical abilities to basically mitigate this. They gave you emergency stop, emergency reverse, and emergency turn. Um, you can use these abilities very quickly. There is a small chance that you will go out of control, and that actually causes damage to your systems if you do that. But you see a ship racing towards you all of a sudden, you know it's going to ram you. You hit the emergency reverse button, and nine times out of ten, you can avoid uh, a ram situation where you will... Um, be heavily damaged and they'll be heavily damaged. In Starfleet uh, Academy, if you rammed someone, that was basically game over. In this game, it's not. Um, you, 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 tend, you will easily survive a ramming, uh, usually, unless you're already badly damaged. And I suppose that actually brings me to survivability. As I said, fighting in Starfleet Academy was very quick, um, over very quickly. It, it's fairly simple. In this game, fights take ages. You can have uh, a one-on-one -on -one fight last easily several minutes, if not longer, uh, until one of you comes out victorious. It depends on the weight of the ship you're fighting with, but even the smaller ships like Birds of Prey and Oberths, they take some time to take down. Uh, and that adds to the uh, starship combat feel. You're not fighting fighters, you're fighting big starships, and so it, it takes time to get them down. So, yeah, I'm... I'm all for it. This 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 whole system works really well, despite little bits of jank here and there. It, it's amazing. Oh, I forgot things like tractor beams. Um, the tractor beam is an absolutely also invaluable tool, also for not for just preventing ramming, but for just holding your target there whilst you lay into them. Um, but it's not just a, a an easy way to win because the the enemy does the every time you catch an enemy in a tractor beam, they turn towards you to face all their forward firepower. And will lay into you so it, it can be just as bad for you as it is good and so you need to have tactical use of the uh, transporter boarding parties also a thing i forgot to mention the ai very occasionally will board you and start taking out subsystems and it's very annoying but you can also uh, do the same you can send way teams over uh, you can damage certain subsystems or you can capture the ship i didn't use this very often because uh, I, I found it difficult to actually use um, but you know 
it, it's it's nice again. You know, it's just all these little things you can do that you have so many tools, not only to fight but also to keep your shit alive, and that, that just adds to the whole simulation uh, in, in a really good way. So all for it, love it. Another thing I really like is the variety of ships that we get to fly. So in Starfleet Academy, we had the Oberth, the Miranda, the Constitution, and the Excelsior class, and that was it. Four ships. I don't think I'm forgetting anything, but anyway. In Klingon Academy, uh, we have at least a dozen, I think. Uh, we've got a couple of types of birds of prey. There's two or three variants of a light cruiser. Um, then we've got a couple of destroyers, uh, uh, cruisers, and got the Katinga. Then you've got the heavier battleships. Uh, it, it's There's a nice progression in the game where you start off in the, the, the weakest ships and then progress to the sort of bigger, but not quite the bigger ships by the end of the Academy term. And then when you're basically thrown into the second half of the game, you're kind of pushed back into a smaller craft. I think it's the uh, destroyer, a destroyer type bird of prey. Uh, and then again, you progress into larger and more powerful warships. But it, it's really nice that we have such variety in what we can fly, and uh, there's a real sense of progression. Um, so that that's another aspect, uh, along with the varied weapon systems that we have that I liked. So what about the graphics? Well, graphics are fine for the time it is. Um, I think the worst part of the graphics is the texturing on a lot of the starships, particularly the Klingon ships. It's very bad when you get sort of close range to them. Um, it, it's probably a thing of the time, but I do think games of this era were starting to look better uh, than what we got here, but it's, it's fine. Uh, the backgrounds and the planet textures are also very, very low res. Uh, planets are just murky nonsense it's it's yeah it, I think there could have been something done better here but I don't know it, it's that sort of time where graphic graphical fidelity was starting to go in leaps and bounds so depending on when this game was starting to be worked on it could be that they just it couldn't be done at the time um, but uh, yeah that that's probably where graphically it, it suffers the most but everything else is presented pretty well. Um, the, the ship models are pretty decent for the time. Uh, the the most impressive thing about this game is the destruction mechanics. Um, so when you uh, hit the hull of something, uh, chunks of it will break off, or bits of the ship will actually uh, fall apart and break off, and you st you'll just start seeing the ship progressively get worse and worse until <laughs> you get these kind of amusing moments where you have, say, for example, a Constitution flying with no warp nacelles at all. It looks ridiculous, and maybe half of its saucer section is also missing. At this point, the ship should really not be functioning or even fighting, but it, it does still happen, and it's kind of funny. But it adds to this kind of visceral... Uh, feeling of the combat itself, you feel like you are doing damage to it. It's not just a, a case of numbers and keeping firing to those numbers are zero. You have this visual representation that what you are doing is having an effect on the ship and doing damage, and it feels satisfying. Just seeing that explosion, seeing the chunks come off, and then once the explosion texture is, is faded away, you see then suddenly there's just a this is a big hole uh, in uh, in its side or the saucer section, and 25 years later, 24 years later since this game came out, I'm still genuinely impressed with this system um, because I, I feel that it's not very common to see, uh, even in modern games, because it's quite hard to do, I would say. I mean, you have to obviously break a model apart, have chunks of it, it it's a lot of extra work, you have to make it seem dynamic, so I, I get it, it's, it's a difficult thing to do. Uh, but I just remember when Bridge Commander came out and I started playing that, I was so disappointed with how it handled uh, the destruction, and we're probably going to get to that because Bridge Commander is next on my list of things to play. So yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. But yeah, love love the destruction stuff. I love also the shields, uh, the way the shields are depicted. If you've ever seen Stargate, Stargate Atlantis, the way shields kind of have this kind of shimmer and then uh, sort of slowly shimmer away until the power is absorbed, that's always my favourite depiction of how uh, a bubble shield would work. It's not just a flash and it stops, it's a flash and then it slowly shimmers away until the energy is dissipated. Uh, this is how this game tends to present shields. Uh, the colour of the shield depends on your faction. It seems to... All the, so Klingons have green shields, Federation have blue shields, uh, the Gorn have reddish shields, and so on and so forth. So yeah, really like that. Uh, the UI is better than Starfleet Academy's, but it 
the only issue is that it doesn't scale with your resolution. So if you the higher the resolution you go, the smaller the UI is, and it makes it harder to see. Uh, the most hard thing to see sometimes is actually just the numbers of your subsystems because the, they get more red as they get more damaged, but the interface is also kind of red, so it actually makes it readability is a bit of an issue. <laughs> I just want to just say that. Um, the actual interfaces into the other panels like damage control, helm, weapons, systems and all that sort of stuff is pretty good. One thing I didn't realise until I was uh, messing around this, uh, in the simulator after the campaign is that when you uh, fly, for example, a Federation ship, all the UI changes. The UI becomes a different colour and also the um, all the sort of system interfaces are completely visually different as well. I mean, everything's in the same place, but it just looks different. I'm like, that's really cool. That's, that's an awesome attention to detail. Same thing with the, the sound effects that go with it. So th there's so much attention to detail here with what they've done. It, it's amazing. I, I, I'm in awe, almost, of, of how good this is. Um, another little tidbit, the, uh, the, the library. I didn't go through the library much, but uh, the library, we had it in Starfleet Academy as well. It's just like things that you can see. What's Earth? What's this starship? It gives you details. But it's all written from the Klingon point of view. I had meant to go through it a bit in a bit more detail, but uh, yeah. Someone went to the effort of, of Klingonizing, you know, at least the Klingon point of view of, of, the, of the Star Trek universe. And <laughs> that's really cool as well. Uh, uh, it's, it's all generally pretty good. Uh, what next? Uh, sound, audio. Um, again, pretty pretty damn good. Um, there's a couple of sections here and there. There's no real audio spam issues like in Starfleet Academy, where you know you had uh, is it Robin, the engineer, constantly telling you about your shields, upper shields down, upper shields restored, lower shields been hit, forward shields have been hit. Forward shields have been hit. Upper shields have been hit. Forward life support has been hit. Starboard shields repaired. Upper shields repaired. Port side shields have been hit. Lower shields have been hit. Upper shields have been hit. Constant, constant, and also a couple of missions where you had this kind of background noise going, just drowning out and overwhelming everything. We don't have that in this game. This is much, much better approached. Um, because Starship combat takes a lot longer, when the officer tells you your shields are at 50%, it's not constant, it's just occasional. So suddenly when you hear, forward shields are buckling, and it's done in a Klingon way. <laughs> Uh, it actually adds to the whole situation. Like, oh shit, gotta gotta move now. Gotta orientate my ship uh, to present a stronger shield or cloak up and, and get away. Uh, I absolutely love the cloaking. It's a typical Trek cloaking sound. Uh, but the audio of it, when you cloak and uh, and uh, decloak, it's it's amazing. You're going for a uh, going for an attack run, break off, cloak. That that kind of it's hard to describe, but it, it just works. I love it. Weapon sounds are punchy, particularly things like torpedoes, with the exception of phasers. That, this is a, a complaint I had last time. Um, the, the phaser sounds don't sound right. First off, they don't sound right. They're not the correct sounds for this era. They're just kind of some kind of weird, whiny sort of sound. And yeah, it should be something uh, more akin to like what the movies did, uh, or at least sort of TNG era, I would say. But aside from the phasers, pretty much everything else uh, is really well done. Uh, the sort of audio alerts you get when you're about to potentially ram something, it, it's all really well done. A, a couple of issues where the, the sounds bug out, so I might have a tractor beam sound just constantly playing even though I've got no tractor beam going. Um, it usually tends to go away when you uh, either reload a mission or transition from mission to mission. But other than that, it's, it's, it was pretty pretty good, pretty well done. No issues there. Um, so yeah, I think I've covered all the major bases now. I think the last thing to talk about is mods. This is the first game that I've played in my Let's Play series of old Star Trek games anyway, where mods are actually a thing this time. Now this game did have uh, a pretty small but strong modding community at the time. Um, I don't think anyone's really modding this anymore, uh, properly anyway. Um, there are people who just still tinker with the game just to make sure that it's functional and you can get the mods there if you want to, but it's it's not that's something that, like, unlike Bridge Commander, which to this day is still actively worked on by other modders, uh, I don't think Klingon Academy really is anymore. But I tried uh, one of the mods, basically the Next Generation Academy, and that just adds, I don't even know how many ships, hundreds maybe, 
a couple of hundred ships are added to the game, different game modes, it supports bigger fleets, uh, you've got better textures on everything. Um, but this this also presented me, because I was, uh, when I played this game, I was on my old PC, and just before uh, I finished the campaign, I transitioned to a new PC. But I did test a couple of the mods out beforehand, and my old PC could not handle this mod very well at all. Uh, even on the, just a, a small combat scenario, I was having a lot of lag issues. But on my new PC, it's absolutely fine. Thing is, my old PC uh, is from 2010, which is still 9, 10 years after this game came out. So it shows just how basically this game's probably mostly using the CPU, CPU bottleneck rather than GPU bottleneck. And I'm, that, I'm basing that on my own understanding of the X Wing Alliance engine and how that was basically entirely CPU bottleneck. Didn't use the GPU until, you know, a, a couple of years ago when we, we broke that. So that, that's probably why it's so poorly optimized in, in this case when it comes to uh, more powerful PCs and a mod. But as far as the mod goes, it was quite fun. There is a custom campaign you can play, and yeah, love it. It's it's great, um, and it adds some replayability to the game. Uh, something that so far we've been missing in most of these games is replayability. Um, so yeah, mods always give a, a get a pass for me for adding replayability to a game if you want to try something else. Because you can play the main campaign with these mods, and it does mess with the power, including it messes with the power of the vanilla ships as well. So. Perhaps one day I'll go back to this and just play this and see how broken it is uh, with uh, the mods on. Because I'm sure it breaks some mission scripting as well, or it causes bugs. But yeah, should be good fun. Okay, that's it. I think I've covered everything. I'm sure I've forgotten something. I I've just been sitting here for the last, oh, let's look, 36 minutes, uh, according to my uh, audacity, rambling about how amazing this game is. Um, and I'm sure I've forgotten something. Uh, it doesn't help that maybe I, I've started doing this two months after I finished fin uh, playing the game, but it, it is what it is. This is this has been a genuine pleasure to play. Of the four games I've now played, is it, we had Final Unity, Harbinger, Starfleet Gaming, and this one. This this has by far been the the most entertaining and uh, justifies my at the moment my giving this game still the one of the the, the top Star Trek games ever made. So yeah. I highly, highly recommend this game to any fan of Star Trek, and even if you're just a Starship Combat Simulator type fan, you might also enjoy this game, I think. Um, as I said, a bit of jank getting it to work, it can be a little difficult and it's hard to get hold of, but it is worth the effort to do so. And I'm someone who firmly believes in the um, preservation of old games, particularly when they're really good ones like this, so we need to preserve this game, absolutely. So. What's next? Next is Bridge Commander. I don't exactly know when I'll begin this. It could be tomorrow or it could be next month. Um, as I said, my energy is completely focused on TFTC right now, so uh, I will be, I will get to it. I promise I will get to it. I am going to play it without mods, so it will just be the vanilla look of uh, Bridge Commander, uh, bar anything I might need to do to get it to run on a modern system. Hopefully that's not so much of an issue, since that is a, f I say fairly modern, <laughs> relatively to, compared to everything else I've played, that is probably the most modern Trek game I've played so far. So should have be facing less issue, technical issues at least. But yeah, that'll be our, our next target. And then after Bridge Commander, I don't know, who knows? What what should we play next? We can continue uh, our playthrough of Star Trek games. I did actually have a hankering to play Half-Life uh, because it was uh, recently the 25th anniversary of Half-Life. And I'm a massive Half-Life fan, so... Suggestions welcome. Suggestions welcome. But... I'm going to leave this here now. Um, if I did forget something, let me know, and I can always comment on the uh, in the in reply to you and what I thought of it. Uh, but yeah, thumbs up, great game, do play it, and until next time, my friends, kapla.